All right, hopefully you have time to answer your bellwork question about this picture. And the good thing about these bellwork questions, even though they are trying to get you to think about something based upon no knowledge whatsoever, as you go through the notes, you can go back and check to see how well you did on your guesses from, uh, from that bellwork question, okay? So we're talking about porifera, which are sponges, pores, and cnidarians, which we've focused on that word before, but now we're going to learn more specifically about them, okay? So sponges are phylum porifera. That means they are pore bearers. They have pores, and the pores are important because they allow flow of water. And that's how these organisms, these animals, very ancient, very primitive um, animals, uh, enable them to feed. That's how they feed, okay? They, they don't have any body symmetry, which means that no matter how you cut them, it's gonna be different. They don't grow like perfectly symmetrical. We'll talk more about that uh, later on in this um, presentation. They're sessile, which means they do not move opposite of motile. They have a flexible skeleton. Think of a sponge that you have at home. Now most of the sponges you probably have at home are uh, synthetic, okay? Or if you have a sponge in the bathroom, it's probably a plant sponge called a loofah, which isn't even a sponge at all. It's plant material. That's cellulose, not spongin, not elastic fibers of protein that look like this when you zoom in on them. And there are different kinds of sponges. They have a very high uh, variety of morphology, different shapes. <clears throat> you have encrusting sponges, vase sponges, columnar sponges, and bowl sponges, among others. We're gonna talk about different ones right now. So the flexible skeletons may also have things called spicules in them. Spicules are transparent, siliceous or calcareous, calcareous um, support structures. Siliceous or siliceous, it doesn't really matter how you pronounce it, <coughs> are made of silica, which is silicone dioxide, glass. So the same glass that makes up the glass of windows is are these materials. And then calcareous is calcium carbonate. So depending upon the species, you'll have different kinds of spicules made out of different things. Now this is an actual picture, uh, microscopic zoomed in of spicules. And these are artistic renderings, which you are going to be copying, hopefully at this time, in your notes into those five boxes. They don't have to be perfect, just really quick. Name, it's a sphere aster, and that's just a sphere star. Sphere star, okay? Calthrops, which are actually um, weapons that can be used in battle. You throw these all over the uh, battlefield, and the horses will step on them, and the people too, and get stopped and slowed down. Um, or you can throw them from the back of a vehicle and the pursuant vehicle will blow their tires out. I don't mean the things from the sponges, I mean like metal ones that people make. Um, this one looks like a grappling hook. Amphi disc, that's a pretty wild looking thing. And just a style, some very simple one. So here are calthrops. Um, so why do you think a sponge would have these types of the, these spicules embedded inside the spongin material. What, might, what purpose might they serve? And if you're thinking maybe, imagine something coming along saying, oh, a soft sponge to bite on. Chomp, and then they bite one of these things, or a mouthful of those. They're gonna back off, right? So if you missed any of these at this point, I've given you enough time to write them, to, cut, to, to jot them down, sketch them down. 
uh, get them from a neighbor or look them up or come back to this later, okay? Sponges are filter feeders. This is what I mentioned before. <clears throat> That's why they're covered in pores. They have, if you look at this cutaway view, they have these openings all around them. The pore cells are called porocytes, pretty easy name to remember. Site means cell, pore means hole, um, and water passes through. The water is moved, the water just won't pass through by itself, right? The water has to be sucked through. There has to be some sort of negative pressure. And that negative pressure is created by the, um, the flagella waving with these collar cells. And you can imagine, you know, a multitude of these collar cells all waving their flagella, which would create a flow of water into, through the pores. And then um, that water is carrying with it microscopic, um, you know, pieces of stuff in the water, like the marine snow we talked about. <coughs> Just the material floating around. And some of that, much of it, is still digestible. And there's still nutrients. Of course, not to mention phytoplankton and zooplankton. Those are yummy. And these filter feeders will pull those out of the water and filter the water. And then um, these amoebocytes will grab those particles and you know, start to digest, digest them and transfer them to the other parts of the sponge that need uh, food. And then the water leaves out through the opening and the opening is called an osculum, an osculum. So here is a little different picture. Here's a, so what they did here is they put a green dye along the outside, and so they could see the um, collar cells pulling in. Well, they can't see the collar cells unless you have a microscope, but they can see the action of the collar cells pulling the water in through the pores and then it coming back out through the osculum. So you can see the flow of the water if you just put a little bit of non-toxic food dye, uh, you know, food coloring into the water by the sponge. Now sponges can reproduce asexually by budding, which means another little tiny sponge grows off its side and then that sponge will either fall off or continue to grow next to it as kind of just another being. Or they can reduce, pre reproduce sexually by releasing gametes out into the environment, sperm and eggs. And that's called spawning. And this is actual spawning of a sponge. Um, it's rele it releases all of the cells get triggered by environmental conditions, temperature, water temperature, you know, uh, currents, things like that. Um, and then they release all of their sperm and egg at the same time. And they go out and mix with other ones because the other ones are also releasing. And so you get that genetic variation. You get sexual reproduction. And then, of course, the babies become planktonic and they float around until they become big enough and they settle down somewhere on some hard sub substance like a rock or a shell or something like that. And then they become sessile and grow into adults. <clears throat> and there are different kinds of sponges. Here we have the encrusting sponge. I think there's a question in your notes about this. Um, so make sure that you think about that. You can come back to it later. These are thin, brightly colored growths on rocks and dead corals. And they're called encrusting because they form this crust of sponge that looks like around uh, things. And they come in all different colors. They're quite beautiful. Then there are these glass sponges. These are very deep water sponges. Um, they have glass spicules. So these are the siliceous or you know, um, silica-based spicules. And they have this lattice-like skeleton that they, that they um, produce. And this is just a skeleton, of course. Um, here's a glass sponge. It was found at 1,500 feet, more than 1,500 feet deep. So. These are not, um, these are animals, and they're not photosynthetic, therefore, so they, they can be in deep water. 
most people don't think sponges are animals. They don't think corals are animals either. Cloud sponges, also very deep water. Um, not as deep as glass sponges, but still, it's a variety of a glass sponge, actually. And they can take many shapes, they can get very big. And they look like just clouds, why they get their name, okay? Boring sponges have, get their name because they bore or tunnel through calcium carbonate, like uh, coral skeletons and shells. I bet you, if you've been to the beach you, and looked down for shells, you found a shell that had a whole bunch of holes in it like that. And you may have wondered how that happened. Well, it's because of boring sponges. At one time, this shell was covered by those sponges that were boring into the calcium carbonate of that clam shell. Sclero sponges, uh, also called coralline sponges, they have, because they have a calcium carbonate skeleton themselves. The form is beneath the body of the sponge. And here's a, they've been known since fossils. So again, like I said at the beginning of these notes, sponges are um, ancient. Very primitive. They're some of the first animals that ever developed, uh, you know, on the planet. So, and they also have um, glass spicules and spongin. They, here, here are some mushroom-like ones, the yellow and orange ones. And this is in a cave, in a marine cave, obviously, in, Mi in Micronesia, Palau, the island of Palau. Bath sponges. These may be the ones that you're familiar with because you, you can buy these uh, and use them literally in the bath or in the sink for cleaning if you so wanted to. Um, and they're soft. They only have spongin protein and fibers, no spicules. <coughs> A really neat, neat place to visit are the sponge docks of Tarpon Springs on the west coast of Florida, just north of Tampa, or just north of uh, Clearwater, St. Petersburg, over there. Um, it's really like if you're in St. Petersburg, Tarpon Springs would be like 35, 40 minutes north of St. Petersburg. And um, they have these boats that go out, and they pull these up from the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. And they've been doing it for a, over 100 years. This whole town is settled by Greek fishermen. Um, and they have Greek food there, several, you know, re restaurants, and it's a very Greek uh, town. But it's a really neat place to go visit. They have an um, aquarium there, and museum, and other things. <clears throat> Cnidarians. Now we're on part two. So we've covered the sponges, the periphera, and now we're moving into the cnidaria. And um, they are cilantrates, which we'll talk about on another slide. I'll tell you what that word means. Um, cilantrata. They are radially symmetrical. So now we're talking, now we've gotten into a higher order of classification of, of, of organisms um, because. Uh, Symmetry is what defines higher order beings. So we have bilateral symmetry for the most part. 99% of us is bilaterally symmetrical. Um, and these are radially symmetrical, meaning that radial like a, like, a, like a wheel, okay? And so you can cut it in, as long as you're cutting through the middle, each half will be no matter, which, no matter which way you cut it, each half will be the same, okay? So, and that means that similar body parts are arranged and repeated around that central part. So no matter which way you cut, you're going to get an equal piece on, on all the sides, all right? Here's a sea wasp or box jellyfish, um, Chironex fleckeri. These are the ones in Australia that um, can kill people within minutes, the box jellyfish. They're very dangerous, and they, they, people get hurt from these all the time. Now, if you've been to the beach and swimming in the beach here, you may have gotten stung 
by a jellyfish, but you, it, it'll leave a rash, an itchy rash that goes away like in a week. This could kill you within minutes, the toxin is so strong. So jellyfish and sea anemones are examples of cnidarians, stinging organisms, okay? And they have tentacles um, and a mouth. Their mouth is their anus, FYI. Um, they have an oral or dorsal surface and an aboral or ventral surface. Um, the oral surface always has the mouth and tentacles and the, um, the aboral always has either some sort of suction arrangement going on or um, or they create a uh, uh, skeleton that they sit in, okay? That, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. So cnidarians have two basic body forms, and you have to label this in your notes, right? So start getting that down. They have the polyp and the medusa. So here is the polyp. Polyps are arranged tentacles up, okay? Think of like an anemone or a coral, okay? And medusae are tentacles down. And these typically are your swimming versions, um, like a jellyfish, but also the planktonic versions of corals um, can also be in this medusa stage. And then when they settle down, they flip over and become sessile and become the polyp stage, okay? So Medusa and Paula. Um, some jellyfish, we'll talk about in a minute, exist as Medusa, but upside down. It's pretty weird. We have those right here in Florida. <clears throat> so you have to do gastrovascular cavity, I think, on both of them. Gastrovascular, that's the digestive and vascular systems together. Um, uh, tentacles, I think you had to do for both, mouth. <clears throat> so tentacles are slender finger-like extensions used to capture food. They have a gut where food is digested, hence the name cilantera, cilantrata. A coelom is a body cavity. And so because these are higher order organisms, one of the things that determines a higher order, order organism from a lower order organism um, is having a body cavity or a coelom. And so that's why these got that name. These were the, the lowest on that level to have um, a coelom, okay? That's why they're called the cilantrata. And they capture prey using these cells, cysts, called nematocysts. So here's a tentacle, and on the tentacle are these cells, if you zoom in, lining here, and they have little triggers on them. If you hit that trigger, if you touch it, it fires a harpoon from this cell called a nitocyte, <coughs> which is in the nematocyst. It's like a coil rope with spines or other th things and harpoons into the prey, whatever the prey may be. The prey could be as something as small as a zooplankton or as big as a fish. You would not be prey, you would just be in the wrong place at the wrong time. <clears throat> so there are different kinds of nematocysts and you're going to draw each one of these in the appropriate places in, on your paper. So there's the glutinant, um, the volvent, and the penetrant. The glutinant, well, what's the major, like, the first part of that word there? Glue. So how do you think that that one captures prey? It's sticky, right? So this one's got this sticky material on it that when, you, when it touches something, it sticks to it and pulls it in, touches the prey. This one is volvent, like it it's involves it. It 
wraps it up. So imagine getting tangled up in vines. That's kind of what's going on here, okay? Or like a net, but not quite so intertwined, more like a vine, okay? If you're walking through the woods and you trip over a vine, well, that's what's going on here. If you touch that trigger, it's going to project this springy vine-like uh, nidocyte or nematocyst out at you, and it's gonna thread-like thing, it's gonna wrap you up. And then if, if it's one of these, maybe these are the worst ones, right? These are the ones that we want to stay away from because they can kill us in some species, with some species, but definitely hurt us. These are the ones that have toxins in them. These are the penetrant ones. These are the ones that will like literally be like a harpoon and stab into you injecting poison. <clears throat> so there are three different types of nematocysts in these cnidarians. Lots of vocabulary. I hope you are making your index cards for this unit test. And so here are actual pictures of, so this is a tentacle, and these are the nidocytes on the tentacle, and you can zoom in some more, and here's one that fired, okay, a discharged one. And so you hit that little, it's called a nidocyl, trigger, and it opens up this operculum, this lid, and the um, threaded harpoon is inside, and it shoots out, and it literally has barbs on it, like a harpoon. So the different kinds of cnidarians, we'll start with the smallest and simplest one called a hydrozoan. These kind of grow like almost everywhere. If you were to look at a piling in the water, when we, when we have the um, Deerfield Beach Marine uh, pier fish swimming around and it focuses on the, um, on the pole sometimes, on that pole, you can see these, but if you look everywhere in the water, uh, on a rock, on, um, on, on a, a dock, on a floating dock, on the bottom of a boat that hasn't been cleaned very often, you will see these hydrozoans. They look like furry, just growth, okay? But if you look up really close, you can see that, they, that they're more like this. They have, they're colonial organisms, um, so they're feathery, bushy colonies of tiny polyps. And like I said, they attach to all kinds of things, all, all hard surfaces. And the, the polyps, depending upon where they form, they're specialized for different things. So defense, feeding, reproduction, so, but they're, they're colonial. And this is what um, a hydrozoan looks like, or hydra. It's called hydra because of the Tentacles coming off of the head, kind of like the Medusa. <clears throat> and so these are the different types of polyps with different, um, so that one's for reproduction, gonozoid, these are for, uh, for feeding, gastrozoids. And here's a close up one of a stinging hydrozoan in Malaysia, in Borneo. Looks like uh, snowflakes, okay? And they have a characteristic larval form of uh, in cnidarians called a planula. Here is a jellyfish with a planula inside. Um, and the planula is planktonic, okay? Eventually settles to the bottom to form a colony of polyps that will grow into uh, that um, colonial hydrozoan that we saw on that last slide, okay? So when these are babies, they're floating around planktonically, and then they settle and they can grow into things like this or like that. But they have to connect to something to mature and feed. Planula, planula larvae. And here are some coral planula that are ready to settle down. So when the sperm and egg meet up in the water, 
eventually by chance, right, because they're all just thrown out there, um, they will form these little babies, you know, embryos, and then the fertilized egg, and then they will grow to be weighted down enough till then they settle down and they're called, and then once they're settled down, they're not planula anymore. Another kind of uh, hydrozoan is a siphonophore. And these are drifting colonies of hydrozoans. And some of them you're familiar with. This is the Physalia physalis, or the Portuguese man of war. And you have to draw the shape of this in that box on your notes. Some of the polyps in the colony, again, just like the, hydros just like the other hydrozoans, are specialized for different things. Reproductive parts, um, digestive parts, uh, feeding parts, the tentacles, okay, or, or, or defense, and then some of them form this float full of gas on, that, that, on the surface of the water. So that it, they're not just planktonic. They have evolved to allow the wind to blow this like a sail. Okay, that's why another, um, another species of siphonophore is called by the wind sailor. That's its, that's its common name, by the wind sailor. And it looks like this, but it's different. And so you may see these washed up on the shore sometimes. You can touch the float because there's no stinging cells. There's no um, nematocysts in the float itself. Just don't touch the tentacles. Usually, though, when these guys get washed up on the beach, their tentacles have been kind of all rubbed away. And, and, but still, you can only touch the float, okay? Just like um, uh, moon jelly, the ones that you see swimming like this in the water, you can touch the top, but you just don't touch the bottom. Scyphozoans. These are large medusae jellyfish that are common everywhere. Okay, this one's called Rhizostoma pulmo, carries a purple blue pigment in its bell fringe here. And these are the tentacles down here. These can get, these can get huge, like this big, okay? <clears throat> Scyphozoans. And then there's Cassiopeia, which is a, mem a class, uh, sorry, um, a member of the Scyphozoans that is the ups it's also called the upside down jellyfish, like this. And these are common here in Florida. Um, <clears throat> tropical waters, warmer coastal regions. <clears throat> if you have ever been snorkeling in the Keys and you are attentive to what you were looking at, you saw these. They're everywhere down there. If you, just anywhere from Key Largo all the way south, possibly up uh, near Miami, but I'm not sure. I don't think I've seen them here, but um, they might be up here. Anyway, they're really neat because they're the only members of, the, of this family that are, are upside down. If you put them in the water, they'll, do, they'll, they'll look like a regular jellyfish, but then when they settle to the bottom, they flip over and their tentacles are up in the air like that, just like this, looking for food. It's pretty wild. Cassiopeia. Now we have the anthozoans. These are your, <coughs> excuse me, solitary or colonial, and they don't have a medusa stage. So they're only polyp stage. Unless, of course, like I said, they're um, floating around, they're planular larvae. That's almost like a medusa. So sea anemones, large muscular polyps. We don't have too many of these right here. In the keys, we have some. Um, but the ones like this are more even colder water, like in the Pacific, huge, thick, muscular sides. And um, this, of course, these fish are native not to Florida, but to um, Asia, Southeast Asia, I think. So the clownfish and um, Australia, the Great Barrier Reef. And the clownfish, you know, are very, are those fish that can live in the, tentacles and not get stung because they have a special mucus coating that protects them. All fish have a mucus coating, but 
Clownfish have this <clears throat> symbiotic relationship with the out with the anemone. Okay. Corals, stony corals, like coral. You know, um, you can still go to the beach and find pieces of coral washed up, but you can't collect coral from a natural environment. It is illegal. It's been illegal since the '60s or '70s because people would just go and like break off pieces of coral and leave them out in the sun to dry and bleach and sell them for decoration or for fish tanks and stuff like that when aquariums were starting to become big back in, in the 60s. Um, so, and, and so coral reefs have been decimated, in, especially in Florida, because of that. So now it's illegal to even touch corals when you find them. Um, yet there are still some, you know, badly behaved scuba divers and snorkelers who don't care and they just step on it and do whatever. So, um, but anyway, this is what they look like when they're alive, all right? And um, they're animals. Corals are animals. They build reefs, huge reefs. Our whole entire state of Florida was once a reef, a whole reef. That's why you, everywhere you dig down, you find limestone. Where that limestone come from? It came from coral reefs. The Gorgonians, there's one up there called a sea fan. Um, that, I was here when I got here, so I don't know where that came from. But you can see it looks just like this. Um, they're colonial. They have tough branching skeleton made out of protein, so they're kind of soft. They do wave a little bit when the current is, you know, moving. Um, and each one of these bumps, this is a close-up view, is a, is a living animal because they live in a colony all together of um, polyps. Precious corals are in this family as well. They come in red, pink. They have calcareous spicules um, and a protein skeleton. And so this is what they look like when they're alive. Each one of these is an, is an individual animal with the tentacles, okay? And they can, you know, if something happens, they can pull the tentacles back in. Um, but underneath is this. And unfortunately, these were also decimated and still are collected by places that don't have rules or by um, poachers who will go in and they will use that to make jewelry, coral jewelry. And then there's black coral, which is not a Gorgonian, um, nor a stony coral. It's just a unique species all by itself. They secrete this hard black protein skeleton. This is what a living spiral black coral looks like. You can't tell that it has this coloration underneath. It's living tissue here. But again, each one of these is its own polyp, okay? And um, again, same thing with the other times, uh, the, the decorative coral or, or the, um, what did I call it? Precious coral, sorry. Um, you can use this to make jewelry, black coral. Some of you may have, some of your parents or grandparents may have some of this uh, from back in the day in their, in their um, collection. I believe Mrs. Keene has some from her mother or grandmother, I should say, um, from a long time ago. She still has it. You know, you're not gonna throw it out, but it's, and I think you can still get it in some places, but you're supporting an industry that's just, you know, just destroying coral reefs. <clears throat> now, we're going, to talk, we're going to finish up our notes on a little bit about the biology of cnidarians. So they are carnivores. Um, they eat other things, right? So they have extracellular and intracellular digestion. What does that mean? They can bring food into their mouth but they can also, some of them, like anemones, they can feed from the outside. Like, imagine taking a Subway sandwich and just putting it on your side and being able to digest it that way. That's the extracellular digestion I'm talking about. That'd be pretty wild. Here's an aquarium anemone eating a fish. If you get the wrong kind of anemone in your aquarium, like a carpet anemone, it will eat everything you have. It'll eat all your fish. 
The fish would be like, oh, what's this? this is, ah, and it dies because of the stinging cells. And then the anemone is like, yum, 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 yum. <clears throat> they don't have brains, but they do have specialized nerve cells that run throughout the organism, and it's called a nerve net. And so their whole body kind of acts like their brain. It's wild. Um, and, and they also have these things that are very similar to our cochlea, or inner ear, the thing that makes you have your balance. So we have fluid in that spiral-shaped organ inside of our inner ear that tells you what is up and what is down. And if you're sick or if whatever, if you spin around too much, you'll push that liquid to one side and it'll make everything spin and it'll make you dizzy. Well, they have something very similar, but instead of the liquid, they have these little tiny stones called statolith. Anything with lith means stone and ciliated hair, your hairs, uh, ciliated cells, I should say, that um, when the stones touch the hairs, it tells the organism which way is up. So if you took a cilantrate, like this anemone here, and you picked it up and turned it sideways, it would say, I don't like this. And it would muscular itself, it would use its muscul muscles to like rearrange its body and, and sit upright again so that it, it could be in the proper position for survival, okay? So it's pretty cool that it can do that. And the final slide here is showing coral reproduction. Just like sponges, they spawn. And this is actual uh, video of the sperm or the eggs in this case being released into the current. And again, they do this in unison. If they did it not in unison, all the eggs would go unfertilized. So they have to do it like, with the right environmental conditions. Um, and here's a close up view of both the egg and I believe sperm following it behind. You can see this cloud behind it. Sperm is always smaller than eggs, right? Um, being released by a coral. So this is like a whole coral head just releasing all of it at the same time. Pretty wild. And it's all just by chance. These are called chancelings. Just like when turtles lay you know, 100 eggs and only two of them survive to adulthood or one or two of them, you know, the rest of them get eaten up by raccoons and birds and fish and other things, you know. And so most of these will never survive to adulthood. And that's it.